Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positron. I'm Barry P. Cook. I'm here to talk about the latest episode of Picard season two. It was called Monsters. And we open on Picard participating in some kind of therapy session in his head, which apparently takes place in the past based on the fact that the uniform and comm badge that his Starfleet therapist, played by James Callis from Battlestar Galactica, is wearing, as well as the fact that the therapist says that people call Picard Captain. So it might be a memory of something that actually happened or something that he's made up and cobbled together as a new experience from elements of the past. And I'm tending to think that it's the latter based on where things go later in the episode. But <clears throat> during this scene, the therapist asks Picard to start telling a story and he hands him like a model of the sun, which I guess is supposed to reference the fact that they went around the sun and went back in time because, you know, that's how they accomplished it. Also, as the therapy session began, we come into the room through a window and out the window we can see the sun, like really kind of close up as if the sh a ship, he's on a ship apparently, and as if the ship were near to the sun. Anyway, he starts telling this story and he starts by talking about a queen with hair that's fiery red like the sun and starts to experience a memory within the memory as he's telling the story. seemingly of himself playing some kind of Arthurian game with his mother. And as it starts, she's telling him that there's no better lesson than that there is no better teacher than one's enemy, which brings up that whole thing about Q has always tried to be a teacher to Picard. She goes on to tell him that he's a prince and that he must learn to lift people up in times of grave danger and to lead people with an inspiring speech, which he says he'll never be able to do, causing her to insist that he will be able to do it. And she knows this because she can see the future. And this occurs after she remarks to him that he's kind of like his dad, uh, to which he sort of bristles uh, and pushes back against, saying he doesn't want to be like his dad, but she says, you know, it's not all bad, which somehow leads her to the part about how he needs to lead, but anyway, the dream soon turns to a nightmare in which he and his mother as queen and a prince are running from a monster within a castle. We go back to the clinic where we see Seven and Rafi take off to go back to the ship to try to figure out a way to track Agnes who is missing. But when they get there, they find that they're locked out by encryption that would seem to have been written by the queen. Meanwhile, Talon attempts to go into Picard's mind with a device that was designed for flesh and blood people, presumably not cybernetic individuals, so I'm not sure how that worked, but there you go. We then join Picard back in the therapy session where he remarks to his psychologist that he wasn't aware that Starfleet used psychologists, which makes no sense given that he knows that they do use counselors as therapists. And a line of dialogue in this scene even makes reference to a betazoid. So it's like, what? <laughs> and, uh, and clearly the writers know about Troy. So well, I, I don't know what that was about. At one point though, the therapist says something about how there are a thousand ways to die in space, which catches, uh, catches Picard off guard, though I wasn't sure why. I immediately felt like it was a reference to something Q might have said to Picard in the past about the dangers of space, but I couldn't find any kind of line of dialogue about that when I looked it up. Though I did find, interestingly, an episode title from the TV show A Thousand Ways to Die, which was hosted by Ron Perlman, and that title was Death, The Final Frontier, which apparently was a reference to Star Trek. Anyway. Back to Talon, we see her entering the dungeon in Picard's mind where she finds the child version of him hiding in the dungeon, who says that he can't leave the dungeon because his mother told him to stay put if they get separated and that he won't leave without his mother. Back in the therapy session, the psychologist insists that Picard is stuck 
and that he holds people at arm's length because he's ashamed of something, that there's a dark version of himself that he doesn't want people to see. Back in the nightmare, Picard and Talon are attacked by a pair of freaky looking creatures as they look for his mother. Back at the clinic, it's apparently the next day, the doctor shows up asking how the patient is, but of course Rios doesn't want to let her into the room where Picard is because he's being mind probed by Talon. But of course it's her clinic and she gets in to the room after getting the keys back from Rios who had the keys. Like why did she give him the keys when that? I don't know. Like complete stranger and she tr trusted him with not only, I don't know, anyway. Of course, she doesn't know what's going on when she walks in and Rio starts to explain. And when the doctor seems to feel like Picard is in some kind of neurological distress, Rios contacts Rafi using his comm badge, presumably a new one he's been issued, unless he found the old one while they were there with Picard, and asks her to send him some kind of a neural stabilizer, which she then beams to him despite moments ago not being able to get into the computer. I don't know. And this occurs right in front of the doctor and then he encourages her to use it on him. And she does and I guess stabilizes him. How's it wrong? And then she asks Rios if he's from outer space and he says, no, I work in outer space. Back on the ship, it would seem that Seven has in fact managed to break the code, which might explain how they got the transporter working. She and Rafi then watch some footage of Gerardi encrypting the computer using the Borg encryption so they know that things are going wrong with her. Back in Picard's mind, we find out that Picard and the therapist are now in the dungeon with Talon and young Picard. And it would seem that the psychologist is actually Picard's father. And Picard confronts him about his treatment of his mother. And the therapist then seems to force Picard to remember a time when his mother had taken him into the tunnels underneath the villa, seemingly in a fit of disassociation, which caused Picard to be trapped in some broken floorboards by his foot, from which his father had to rescue him. After which he explains to adult Picard that his mother caused that to happen because she was out of her mind momentarily, which was a result of the fact that she needed help, but refused it. And Picard comes to see his father more sympathetically than he had all his life. And Talon remarks to young Picard that this pain that he's going through is what will in the future allow him to save worlds. And just before present day Picard wakes up back in the clinic, young Picard in this memory takes a key from his pocket to open the door to the room that his mother was being held in during her disassociative state causing Talon to realize that there's more to the story. Rios then has a moment with the doctor where he explains that he's very loyal to Picard because he's like a father to him. And then he fricking beams them to the ship himself, the doctor and the boy, which I do not understand, but it does fall in line with my theory that she and the boy are going to join him when he goes back to the future, a la the Oceanic scientist from Star Trek IV. Then we're back to Rafi and Seven trying to find Agnes while it's still daylight in LA. But then the moment we see Agnes, it's dark out as she goes into a bar where Patrick Stewart's real life wife is performing a song from her real life album. And I think what explains the daytime nighttime thing is that we're seeing a flashback to the night before, right after the gala, when we see Agnes while simultaneously seeing Rafi and Seven on her trail. It was kind of weird, but okay, that's, I guess, what they were doing. We see Agnes break a window with her fists in this club, but we don't quite know why at that moment. Back with Talon and Picard, she reveals that she is, in fact, Romulan, which I guess makes her appearance make sense, and which I began to suspect probably was true when I saw the previews for this episode in which you can see that her earpiece is pointed like a Romulan ear and that it also resembles an ear covering worn by a Romulan character in Star Trek V. And she explains that she hides the fact that she has pointed ears by way of a technological glamour, kind of like we've seen on Discovery. 
that for some reason has an eight hour cooldown once you turn it off before you can turn it back on. I don't know why they bothered to mention that. My guess is that will come into play later. They have a conversation about how it would seem that Q wants Picard to know more about himself and that this might be what the whole thing is about, why he's done what he's done. At which point Picard theorizes that maybe Q is doing that that way as a way to explain that he wants Picard to learn more about him. Something that Picard theorizes could be the key to allowing them to figure out how to go on the offensive against Q rather than playing defense. And so they need to get in touch with him, which Picard thinks Guinan would be able to do. And when he visits her and asks her to do exactly that, she attempts to do it by knocking back a drink from some kind of mystic bottle that contains the energy of a moment when her people and the Q struck some kind of truce, but it doesn't seem to work. Meanwhile, Raffi and Seven realize that the queen is going around trying to cause more endorphins to flow through Agnes's system to speed up the assimilation process so that she can completely take over, even though she kind of already has completely taken over, so that she can then start to assimilate people. Uh, okay. Then we join Picard and Guinan back at 10 forward again, as Guinan's struggling to understand why the summoning didn't work, as someone does in fact come into the bar and starts talking about science fiction and whether or not aliens exist. And then he whips out an iPad type device on which he displays video from days prior of Picard being in, beaming into LA before arresting he and Guinan. And I'm wondering if he's with the time police or the temporal police or whatever it is. So that's where the episode ends. I enjoyed this episode. I found that it had elements of a really good TNG episode, all the stuff with Picard and the therapist and the dream within the dream that he has as part of that therapy session and the sort of conclusion that it leads him to where he learns that no, his father wasn't really this monster. He was dealing with a wife that was not all there who would have, I guess, disassociative episodes, but refused help for her situation. And I think that's the kind of story we would have seen in Next Gen. And I think it's an appropriate story for this character, given that we know that he did in fact sort of resent his father and had an estranged relationship with his strict father and that he was always sympathetic to his mother. And seeing this makes that make sense. We never knew why that was. We never knew the details. So not only does this make that make sense, as I just said, but I think it's real. I think it's reflective of things that can happen in real life. And I think it is reminiscent of other stories that were told in TNG about, and DS9, and probably Voyager, maybe Enterprise, I don't know, but definitely TNG, where people deal with their trauma after years of having first experienced it and realize that the way they framed things in their mind or allowed themselves to understand things within their mind wasn't how things really were. And that finally understanding how things really were sort of helps them let go of pain and bitterness because the bitterness that they were harboring, the pain that they were feeling was misplaced. So I thought that was very good. The thing is, I don't know, I think it's out of place in the character's history. I think it would have been better if this story had come about during the run of Next Generation or perhaps during the films. There were certainly things that the character went through over the course of the show and the films that would have made it possible to work this story in. And the reason I think it would have been better that way is because, you know, if it had happened sooner, is because it's so late in his life now. And the idea that Q only now sort of started to put him through something where he would reckon with this when they've had so many interactions before doesn't make sense. It feels misplaced in time to me, if that makes sense. I mean, I suppose it doesn't matter when someone comes to these realizations, when 
they end up facing their past, examining it in a way they never had before. I suppose that can happen at any stage of life, but I don't know. I, I think it's maybe it's just a problem of the real world fact that so much time has passed between the end of next generation and now. And that in between, you know, and I say, when I say end of next generation, I mean nemesis. And that in between, you know, we've only had the one season of episodes. So it feels like, I don't know, I don't know. I just, I'm not feeling the connection with it the way I think I would have felt it if it had taken place during the series when our familiarity with Picard was like right there as opposed to displaced by 30 years. But I don't know, that could be just me. Anyway, other than that, I think it's great that they are doing this with the character because Star Trek was always supposed to examine the human condition. And that's what this story does. This element of the, you know, the, the overall story of Picard season two does. So I have to give them props for that. James Callis was excellent in his part. And I'm actually looking forward to seeing what the rest of the story is because Talon notes that, wait a minute, there's more to this story just as Picard wakes up. So I think we're gonna see more. And I think that's good. The only thing is that it sort of goes around other traumas that Picard has experienced in his life, assimilation and the whole thing when he was held captive by the Cardassians, which, you know, we've kind of explored how the Borg thing, you know, his assimilation affected him. He also lived that other life in inner light and that's affected who he is, so I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if this fits with the character at this stage. I think it would have fit better before Inner Light, for example, before his assimilation, before the Cardassian captivity. So yeah, it just doesn't seem to fit this stage of his life. But again, it, it was good nonetheless, and I was glad to see it because it does examine the human condition and it was a, a good bit, so there you go. Anyway. I'm looking forward to where it goes from here. Who are the people that arrested Picard and Guinan? When are we gonna see Q again? What's that gonna be about? I think this thing they've talked that Picard mentions about, hey, we've got to figure out about Q's past and delve into that could be interesting. We still have to find out what's going on with Corey and Dr. Sung. And let's not forget Renee. We still don't know that whole how that whole thing is gonna go, presumably. That's gonna end up turning out all right, but we don't know how. So there's more to get to, and there are three episodes left. So I will be back with a review of the next episode. Until then, I take my leave and I wish you peace and long life.